Hello, um, I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Public Sector Committee to this event this afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining us and a very warm and special welcome to Myra, who has come along to lead this session on effective communication in leadership. Before we get into the detail of that, I'm just going to go over a little bit of housekeeping. So any questions that you may have as we progress throughout the, the next hour or so, um, could we please ask that you put them in the Q&A box and we'll pick those up and answer them at the end. Um, also, just to let you know that this session is being recorded and the slides will be circulated after the event. So at this stage, I'd just like to hand over to Myra and, and welcome her and say thank you very much. And we're looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say on this session, Myra. Thank you so much, Annette. I really appreciate that. So thank you for the warm welcome. So I'm just going to share my screen with you all and get the slides up so we can begin the session. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this session. Um, as Annette said, my name is Myra Noaz. So thank you all for joining. And I would like to thank the Chartered Institute of um, Accountants Ireland for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, so I'm super excited to deliver this session to you and um, you're uh, all very welcome. So over the next hour, we are going to um, learn together. We're going to explore the topic of effective communication in leadership. And we're also going to have a little bit of fun today. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been successfully leading teams for around 20 years in a variety of sectors, mostly in construction and manufacturing, but I've also worked in hospitality and communications. And I've mostly worked in senior leadership positions, director level and board level positions for the last 15 years. And I've also lectured for a couple of years, which really has given me the love for what I do now. So I am really passionate about high performance and leadership and lifelong learning. And whenever I was exploring continuous development, um, I realized that there was a gap for busy time poor leaders who want to continue to grow and learn and develop and connect with other like-minded leaders. So I find it uh, Become More, which offers online leadership development programs. All the sessions are delivered in 60 minutes, just like this one. So it's great for people like yourselves to dip into a session, hopefully learn something and continue to develop and grow. So the... Um, vision uh, for the company is nourishing minds, empowering growth and creating positive futures. All of the content uh, will positively impact you in your personal life as well as your prof professional journey. So hopefully you'll get some hints and tips today that you can use in both your professional world as well as your personal life as well. So we are going to be using the chat box today and I will be keeping an eye on the chat box as we go through. So um, I hope that you will use the chat box and get involved in the session. So the first fun fact is that if you participate in this lesson and use the chat box and answer many of the questions that I'll ask you throughout, the impact of this lesson will increase by 25%. So that's quite a bit large number. So hopefully you'll all um, get involved and answer some of the questions that I ask throughout. So this is your time today to grow and focus on you and your personal and professional development and growth. And this is a statement which I love. When you grow, everyone grows. Growth really is infectious. And whenever you invest in you and you invest in your learning, then it's not just you that grows, it's everyone around you. It's all of those in your team. It's all of those in your personal life as well as your professional world. So um, this really will hopefully benefit you today. So the first question I want to ask you, and I'm going to open the chat box, um, just to make sure that everybody can use the chat box and you have located it, is do any of you know how long it takes to regain focus if you get an interruption throughout the day? So how long on average does it take to regain focus after you get an interruption? So type your answers into the chat box and we'll see if any of you get, get the answer right or get close and we'll see who's closest. So let's see what you think about that. So how long does it take to regain focus after you get interrupted? And just think about how many interruptions you get throughout the day. Um, you know, 10 minutes, Annette, okay, great. Um, because you will get uh, a lot of interruptions throughout the day, people tapping you in the shoulder, people um, just saying, can you help me with this? Um, so any other ideas and suggestions? 
Okay, so the actual answer is 23 minutes. It takes 23 minutes to regain focus after an interruption. Um, so just think about how many times you get interrupted throughout the day. So it really is important to have focus sprints or time without interruptions uh, within your diary throughout the day. So today's session is on the topic of effective communication and leadership. And communication is really at the core of the accounting profession. As when you're transmitting information from one person to another, or from one organization to another, or maybe it's a combination of both, you'll be communicating. Um, okay, so Sarah has said the chat box isn't working. So if anybody could use the Q&A box um, for the participation in any of the questions, that would be great. So thank you for advising, Sarah. Um, so whenever you're communicating financial information, you um, will be communicating it to shareholders, to stakeholders, and it's important that you communicate this information clearly and concisely. And you'll be communicating both internally and externally. So it's very important that you can effectively communicate in your accountancy roles. In accountancy, you will be using and creating lots of data. So financial statements, spreadsheets, formulas, you'll be using ratios, that type of information. You'll be creating balance sheets, those cash flow statements. And these will be most impactful whenever you can effectively communicate these to others. You also must communicate clearly and effectively about complex financial matters with people who may not be familiar with finance. So communicating effectively is very important in accountancy. So I want you to consider this question. Do you think you're a good communicator? So just think about that. And the answer to that question will probably be yes. Because you're in a position of authority, um, you may be leaders within your business, I'm pretty sure that most of you, if not all, have pretty effective communication skills. But like most things in life, the more you study or the more you practice them, the better you get at it. So we'll discover why is communication important in leadership? So a leader is really someone who inspires positive incremental change by empowering those around them to work towards a common objective. And a leader's most powerful tool for doing this is communication. Effective communication is vital to gain trust and align efforts in the pursuit of goals. Regular, clear financial communication will help stakeholders have an accurate picture of the financial health, which informs how they communicate with their teams, formulate strategies within the business, and ultimately make decisions. Effective communication can inspire positive change and innovation. So when communication is lacking, important information can be misinterpreted. And this can cause relationships to suffer, and ultimately it can create barriers or hinder progress. So financial statements you're producing will contain key information which will help companies uh, with their goal setting, with their benchmark setting, and it will help organizations both on a team level and an individual level, as well as an organization level. Additionally, you can communicate progress towards goals over time and articulate how efforts impact the, the company's financial metrics. And having a deeper understanding of how goals affect um, the organization will empower employees at every level within an organization. So as an accountant, you may have to rely on information about um, the organization's financial health, and you may have to relay this information to stakeholders, including executives, board members, and investors. So there was a professor within Harvard Business School, and he said, accounting is how we represent in a concrete way, past performance, future performance, and a value of an organization. So he said, it is critical and vital to gain trust. So summarizing and highlighting important financial information, both verbally and in writing, enables you to communicate effectively. Um, and this will help the company make decisions, not just now, but also in the future. So effective communication is particularly important in your profession. So let me ask you a question. And I believe now the chat box is working, which is just perfect timing. So let me ask you a question and you should be able to use the chat box. So hopefully I'll be able to see your answers come in. Do you think communication is more of an art or more of a science? 
So please type your answers in. So Joanne Kelly, straight off art, okay, brilliant art, okay, Caitlin, art, art, Helen Burns, art, Tracy, art, Paula, okay, Annette, yeah, okay. So we have loads of say art. Quite a few are saying both. I haven't seen any science. <laughs> Um, just to lose that art. Okay, so I think, you know, looking at the number of answers that come in there, I think that probably the art was the majority of the answers. Oh, Gareth, there we go, we want the wrong science. So Gareth believes it's a science. So thank you for that, Gareth. <clears throat> well, the good news is that you're all actually right because uh, communication is actually both. Um, so those that got both are fine and those that had art or science, um, yeah, it, it is a mixture of both. Not only do great communicators have a firm grasp on the mechanics of communication and they use science-based formula that combine facts, logic, and behavioral science when they engage with people, effective communication also taps into people's creative sides and people's brains and uses emotional intelligence to strike a rapport and build an established uh, trust-based relationship. So this is one of the most memorable communications ever. Um, it was by Martin Luther King, and it was a speech, I have a dream. And this speech was more of an artistic endeavor than a scientific one. And it creates a feeling whenever you hear that, whenever you hear that speech. Another great example of communication is this quote from Maya Angelou. And this is actually my favorite quote. I've learned that people will forget what you've said, People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And it really is the creative artistic elements within these statements or speeches, which make them so powerful and memorable. And that is because you feel something when you hear words communicated like this. And this is because communication, uh, whenever you communicate effectively, you are communicating not only with your conscious mind, you're also connecting with your emotional subconscious mind, and therefore you'll be more inclined to remember them. And this is because we actually communicate on three different levels. So whenever we're communicating, we're communicating on three different levels. And these are the three levels. We communicate consciously through our words, our gestures, and our writing. We communicate subconsciously through our vibrations or the energy that we're giving out. And physically, we communicate through the actions, through the actions that we take. And this actually means that when we're communicating, we're communicating both verbally and we're communicating non-verbally. Gestures, posture and pose and other non-verbal expressions usually express a variety of subtle signals. And these non-verbal cues can present to the listener um, what's actually happening within a person's thoughts or within a person's feelings. So I have another question for you. What percentage of communication do you think is done through verbal communication? So the words that we speak. So I'd be interested to hear your answers in the chat box. What percentage of communication, 80? Okay. 70, 40, 30, okay, 20, 50, 30, 20, 70. 50, 40, okay, excellent, you're a 10. Okay, so a big variety of answers there, um, ranging from sort of 10 right through to 70, 80%. There was one person that got it right, and that was Cluda. She got 7%. So this is actually um, how much percentage we communicate through each of the different ways. So, uh, Clodo, well done, congratulations. Uh, behavioral psychologist, Dr. Mabraham, done extensive research into the topic of body language. And he indicated after his research, and this is sources from the Open University, that only 7% of communication is actually done through verbal communication, the words we speak. Whereas the non-verbal component of our daily communication um, so 38% through our tonality of our voice, 55% um, through a person's body language, their facial expressions. So it just demonstrates actually that the words we speak are a small component of how we communicate on a daily basis. 
So whenever I've seen that, whenever I studied this and, and was, you know, looking into this topic um, extensively, um, I didn't um, believe it would be 7%, but I've looked at this topic for, for a long time now, and this is what the research indicates. Obviously, it varies in various different situations, but overall, um, it does make you think that, you know, you really need to take into consideration your body language and your nonverbal communication. And when you're communicating effectively, the message, messages you're sending out verbally on your conscious level must be in harmony with the feelings that you're expressing non-verbally on your subconscious level. And this is because we have two parts of our mind. We have our conscious thinking mind and we have our subconscious emotional mind. And whatever you feel subconsciously, you will non-verbally transmit to the person you're speaking to. And that person will pick up on your feelings, whether you are consciously aware of that or not. So I'll give you an example of this. If you um, and your your husband say are annoyed about something, um, and uh, you know you ask them are they all right, and they say yes I'm fine, but you know really they're not, and you can usually pick this up through your intuition. Similarly, if you come home from work and somebody's in a bad mood in the house, you can usually pick that up. You can pick up their energy. And if you're in a meeting with uh, one of your team or someone, one of your colleagues, and you ask them to do something, um, and you know you ask them to do a certain task, for example, and you know they're not particularly happy to do it, and you pick up on their vibes or their energy that maybe tells you they're not really that happy about it, but they say, oh yeah, it's absolutely fine, but you can usually tell. And the reason for this is that you can pick up on their energy, and you can pick up on what's happening subconsciously or the energy that they're subconsciously given off through your intuition. And the fact that we communicate um, on three different levels is particularly important for sales teams to understand. Because if a prospect is hearing a series of words that indicate, I want to help you, but the feelings that they're picking up um, from the salesperson is saying, I have to make this sale, then really what happens is that dual messaging causes conflict and it causes dual messaging to be sent out. And this causes a state of confusion and that will really stall the sales process. And that's why research indicates that whenever salespeople are on the phone, that they should smile. Um, and when they're communicating on a video call, they should smile and they will achieve better results. And that goes for all of us because we're all now after COVID, we're all on a lot more video calls. Um, we're dealing with a lot more people virtually. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to think about your body language, think about how you're coming across and how, you know, you're presenting yourself in terms of your smiling, your eye contact, even if it is through a screen. So there is a theory which I'm sure most of you have heard about, and it is that most people are either left brained or right brained, meaning that one side of their brain is more dominant. And this theory first came to light in the 1960s, thanks to a uh, research um, psychobiologist and Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Roger Sperry. And he discovered the brain has two hemispheres which function differently. If you're more analytical and methodical in your thinking, then the theory says you're more left-brained. Um, and if you tend to be more creative or artistic, then you tend to be more right-brained. So this um, diagram will hopefully help you sort of um, understand this theory a little bit better. So the left brain is more analytical and orderly than the right brain. So the left brain helps you with logic, sequencing, linear thinking, mathematics, facts, thinking in words. A lot of the stuff that these guys will be doing in accountancy. So a lot of the stuff will, will make sense to you guys on the left side of the brain. However, the right side of the brain, it's more visual and more intuitive. It is more um, creativity and a less organized way of thinking. So the right brain helps people with um, imagination, holistic thinking, intuition, arts, rhythm, nonverbal cues, uh, visual visualization and daydreaming. So if any of you are a bit of a daydreamer, that would be more right brain thinking. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun with this today. I do realize that you're all accountants. <laughs> so it will be interesting to see if we have any right brand uh, within this group. 
Uh, so we have about 113 on this call. So we're going to do a little bit of a poll today. Um, and first of all, I want you to jot down which side of your brain you think is more dominant, left side of the brain or right side of the brain. And then um, don't share in the chat box. Oh, Alison, don't share. <laughs> just, just write it down on your page. And then what I would like you to do is we're going to do a poll. And um, Karen, can I ask you to um, put the poll up, please? Um, and there is the question. So can you please just uh, select either left or right? Um, and I'm really interested today to see um, if we have any or what percentage of this group may be right <laughs> Um, And we're going to then once we have done the poll, um, we're going to ask you to see if you can guess what percentage are left and what percentage are right. So um, I'll give you a few moments just to answer this question. So please all put your answer in. So choose either left or right. And it'd be great if everybody could participate. Um, and we'll see if we have any, what, what the percentage of each is within this group. I think out of all of the training I've done around this topic, um, this one might be skewed most <laughs> to one side, <laughs> but I thought it'd be interesting to do nonetheless. Okay, so hopefully you've all had a chance to do that. Okay. So we've got Raymond's guessing 90% left, Lorraine's guessing 80% left. Okay, so everybody guess in the chat box what you think. So 80%, okay, 90 left, Manila, Sophie 90, 95 Gareth, this is the highest so far. Okay, 80, 75, 90, okay, 95 Chris, okay, 80 Allison. Okay, fantastic, at least 80%. Yeah, I I reckon it's going to be in the high 80s or 90s, um, 80% left. Okay, so we've got, I think there was maybe some in the 70s there, but most were in the 80s, if not 90s. So um, in a group of accountants, let's see how many of you are more creative accountants. So drum roll, and then Karen, can I ask you to reveal what the answer? Okay, so 89%. We have 11% of you guys that are right brain creative accounting. So, wow, okay, brilliant. I'm left, so 89. So I'm not sure, did anybody get 89? If you did, you can uh, type your name in the chat box. So you got 89. So I don't know if anybody got it spot on, but that's really interesting actually. So there is 11% of the accountants within this group are more right brain, so that's fantastic. Um, and within accountancy, you do need to have both skills. You do need to be a little bit creative as well as obviously the, the analytical. And sometimes it's very obvious for people whether they're more left-brained or more right-brained. Um, you know, people who tend to work with facts and figures and accountants do tend to be more left-brained. And people who work in creative roles such as marketing tend to be more right-brained. Um, and some people tend to be equally both. And a way that you can tell whether a person is predominantly more left-brained or right-brained is that if somebody says, I think, then they tend to be more left-brained. However, if somebody says um, that they are more, uh, if somebody says that I think, then they're more left-brained. And if somebody says, I feel, I feel, then they tend to be more right-brained. But there's no right or wrong answer. And so I'm really saying, can you test this? So I do have a quiz that I can send to Karen after, and we can send that to you guys. So there is questions that you can answer and then it sort of does tell you which side. But, you know, we all tend to flip from one side to the other and we do tend to use one side of our brain, um, well, different sides of our brains whenever we need to in certain circumstances. But people tend to be one or the other um, the majority of the time. But nonetheless, whenever you are an effective communicator, it's important to know your audience. Um, and whenever you know your audience or your team members or the clients that you work with and try and understand them better um, and try and understand maybe if they're more left-brained or more right-brained, then it can help you approach conversations, it can help you approach meetings, and it can help how you provide information to them. So a left-brained person, they will prefer to have more of a structured conversation with lots of facts and figures, whereas a right brain person will prefer to have more of a casual approach with more images, a conversation that includes maybe creativity and story behind it, um, and maybe more feelings in terms of how you communicate with them. 
And you consider whenever you're communicating with your team or in your one-to-ones or with colleagues, whether they're maybe more right-brained or more left-brained. Um, my previous manager was certainly more left-brained and he loved lots of data. So whenever I was presenting to him, I would have always presented lots of facts and figures. Um, and that's how they, he would have liked the information presented. And if you're communicating to a large audience, so if you're presenting something to a large audience within a company or, uh, you know, in a certain circumstance, then it's good to include information, what resonates with both. So if you're in sales or you're in accountancy, whatever profession you're in, it's important to understand how they want to have the information presented to them. So there's five ways that you can grab the attention of your audience. So if you are speaking to a large audience, there's five things that you can do. The first thing to grab people's attention is to pause. There is immense power in a pause. And at the beginning of your presentation, if you stop and pause and say nothing, you will get your audience's attention. The second way is to use provocative stats or quotes. So that's 7% that we had uh, seen earlier in the presentation, which relates to uh, you know, your spoken words as part of communication. You will probably remember that now. Um, you know, there was somebody there, Cloda had maybe seen that before and she remembered it because um, she was straight in with the 7%. So hopefully you'll remember that stat because it is quite provocative and it gets you to remember something within the presentation. If you engage in activity, so the way I'm using the chat box today to try and get you to engage, or if you are in a large room with lots of people, you can get them to engage and get people involved, which really helps with communication. And another way is to emotionally connect. If you can emotionally connect with something and get some, someone to feel something, then it really helps them to remember what it is that you're communicating. And I'm going to show you a video at the end of this presentation today, which is a very emotionally uh, charged video. And there's really great message in, in it. But again, it's to really uh, get you to remember and feel something while you're watching it. And the fifth way is to tell a story. And you can do this um, in accountancy because um, we're all hardwired for stories. And in accountancy, you can do what you call data storytelling, which is whenever you take raw data and numbers and communicate the insights through narrative or visualization. So this is effective communication because it prompts you to think about key ideas. So what you would think about if you were um, trying to create a data storytelling scenario would be, what is the context? Who are the stakeholders? What is the problem? How do I suggest the problem is solved? And then you could produce action oriented narrative um, and a structure that really helps non-finance professionals understand and maybe see the bigger picture and understand what it is that you're trying to communicate to them. So you really can create a story through the data and the figures and the facts that you're producing to show them how this helps a problem and creates a solution for them. So I have another question for you. Um, how many people in this call um, would say that they work in sales? Is there anyone in this call that would say, yes, I'm involved in sales within the company that I work with? So you can type a yes into the chat box. If you do consider, yes, okay, quite a few, which is great. Brilliant. So there's a few, okay, no, yes, yes, mostly, mostly yes um, and no's. And a few obviously haven't answered that question. So um, one thing to consider is, I know all of you are accountants, but um, we all are within business, no matter what business we are involved in, we are either directly or indirectly involved in sales within our organization. It may not be direct sales related to your role, but businesses and practices don't exist without their clients and without bringing people on and without their stakeholders and presenting information to help assist them make decision making and help other companies um, decide on profits, margin, price, and all of that contributes to the sale of a business. So what do you do, no matter what role you're in within your organization, impacts the reputation of your business. And again, that affects the performance and the outcomes and the bottom line of the business. So think about that whenever you're um, you know, communicating also. Does anyone know whose logo this is? Again, type your answers into the chat box. 
Tauda, I see now how you and I. <laughs> it is Tauda. Okay, brilliant. So most of you know who this is. So Tauda, we're going to look at just today um, as a little bit of an example of a company who has really used left brain, right brain strategy incredibly well to enhance their sales and become one of the best car companies in the world. When a person enters the car showroom, the sales team in Toyota are trained to ask a number of specific questions to determine whether that person is more left-brained or more right-brained. And the answer to these questions determine the route and the experience of the test drive that that person actually takes. So for the right brain person, uh, the 9% of you in this group, they would focus on the aesthetics of the car, or maybe it's 11, 11% actually, there was uh, right brain people within this group. So for you, they would focus on the aesthetics of the car and they would focus on the color of the car, the interiors, the feel of the steering wheel, the comfort of the car. And the customer would take a test drive through a beautiful rural area with lovely views. And they would talk about how the car feels to drive, the comfort of the car. They would talk about features like the sunroof and they would talk about the heated seats. They would play lovely, relaxing music. And they would ask questions like, um, how could you imagine yourself in this car? How do you feel in this car? And for the other then 89% of you on this call, the left brain, more focused people, they would focus on the performance features of the car. So they would take a test drive through a town or a city and they would demonstrate the technical features of the car, such as the power, the speed and the displays. And they would talk about uh, facts like the engine size, the wheels, the road surface, the conditions. And they would refer to the special features such as the air conditioning system within the car. And then they would ensure that there was a motorway as part of the route back to the showroom. And they would demonstrate the speed of the car and the acceleration of the car. And this approach enabled them to tailor their product and their services to align with their customer preferences. And this has resulted in an enhanced customer experience. They cleverly um, delivered a personalized experience to meet each um, of their customers' unique requirements. So just think about that whenever you uh, bought your last car, what were you more interested in? And you know if that approach that um, Toyota used would have worked better for you if you were taken on a really personalized uh, driving experience. So Toyota also incorporated this strategy into their digital marketing campaigns to target potential customers based on their likes. So I'm going to show you a short video. Um, they've named the video just like you, and it's for the Toyota RAV4 hybrid car. And they created 100,000 videos with individualized targeted messaging. Um, so this has really made this one of the most personalized video campaigns in the world. So I'm going to share this with you because it really is a smart marketing technique, but ultimately it is smart communication. Hey there, you're an individual and so is everyone else. And this is all the stuff that makes each of us unique. But if we're all unique, why does advertising treat us like the same person? It shouldn't. Like you, the RAV4 hybrid is also pretty unique. It's the only compact hybrid SUV on the market after all. So we wanted to prove it's just as unique as you. Introducing RAV4U. 100,000 unique, personalized videos designed to be relevant to every kind of RAV4 driver. Starring this guy. Everyone has different interests, and Facebook tells us who's into what. For example, some RAV4 people are into martial arts and cooking. Others are into marathons and concerts. With Facebook's interest data and a unique editing technique, we created 100,000 videos. Here's how. We started with an intro clip based on the viewer's interest. If you have an unrivaled passion for both martial arts and cooking, it's probably a combo that serves up a mean knuckle sandwich. We matched it to a clip that highlighted a RAV4 feature. It's a compact SUV and a hybrid and finished each video with some humor. That's two awesome things in one, like a dog, but made of cats. What? RAV4! Each beginning, middle, and end was written and filmed to be interchangeable, then algorithmically edited to create a huge number of unique films. Then those final videos were served to our individuals. For example, if you're a one-show digital judge, you're probably into technology. 
here's one for you. James Marsden appreciates your love of technology. The RAV4 Hybrid, it's all about tech, like its available integrated navigation system with 7-inch touchscreen. Now, if there were only a technology that could block these ads... Actually, there is there's a... not. RAV4! The result is the world's most personalized video campaign. Content designed to suit every driver. Hey there. Okay, so um, ultimately that's how uh, Toyota have used smart communication because they're communicating in a way that people like to hear it based on market intelligence and insights and therefore you're more likely to listen. So based on your role as leaders, you may want to think of some questions that you could ask people that you interact with or tailor your conversation based on whether you think they're maybe more uh, right-brained or left-brained. So I'm going to show you another short video now, uh, which will provide some helpful skills to help you communicate effectively. Great communication. There's a big topic. How do we communicate great in today's world? It's not easy. It's never been harder. The world we live in today moves fast. Attention spans are low. Everybody has enormous information at their fingertips. People don't listen very well anymore. It's hard to be heard in the 21st century. So how do we communicate really, really well in that kind of an environment? It's not easy, but we can make it easier for you. And here's how. Think about anybody that does anything at a very, very high level. Think about the singers, the actors, the dancers that you know. Think about the athletes that you know. And if you look closely at the way they have become very good at what they do, they all prepare in the same way. They all practice their skill in the same way. They break the skill down into smaller pieces. They improve their performance on each piece. They put all the pieces back together. And then all of a sudden, they're performing at a higher level. That's the way we want you to think about your communication skills. Let's break it down into smaller pieces. Communication is a big topic. Let's make it more manageable. We think communication comes down to four key skills. Number one, how you assess situations, how you look at the world around you, your level of awareness, how well you listen. The better we are able to assess what's going on around us, the more likely we are to communicate in a way that's relevant to people. Number two, message. How well do we build a message plan based on what we've learned? How do we put it together? What's most important? What do we include? What do we leave out? What do we lead with? The better we can build a message plan, the better we will communicate. Number three, document. How well do we translate that message into whatever document we need on that day? Maybe it's an email, maybe it's a white paper or a memo, maybe it's a PowerPoint presentation. But how well do we take that message and then translate it into a document that's actually gonna help us in that meeting, in that conversation. And number four, deliver. How well do we deliver? How well do we speak? How well can we command attention with presence when we stand in front of the room or when we lead the phone call or when we participate in a conversation? Don't just think about your communication skills as this one big thing. It's actually four things. And your ability to number one, assess situations, number two, build good message plans, number three, translate that message into a document that helps, and number four, deliver with confidence and presence. Think about each of those four skills, work on each one of those skills, put those skills back together, and then guess what? You're gonna be communicating at a much higher level. Okay, so I think that's a useful video um, broken down into four areas. So the first one is to properly assess the situation and then create your message, decide on the best form of communication and then deliver it with confidence and presence. So those are four key areas you can work on to help you communicate more effectively. So I'm gonna cover a few helpful tips for, to help you communicate more effectively. And the first one that we've touched on already, which is to adapt your communication style to your audience. So a successful communicator must take into uh, consideration their audience perspective. 
and distill information and determine the most effective way to communicate to that audience. So as accountants, questions that you may consider is, what is their level of financial knowledge? What financial information do they need to know to help them to do their jobs effectively? And what information is unnecessary? There may be information that you can remove, which will make it easier to understand for the audience. And what method of communication would be more helpful to them? So, for example, if an audience is, um, you know, a fellow finance employee, sending them a financial statement in an email with a brief note um, about what you want to highlight may be suffice. However, if your audience is a sales or a marketing team, the best way to communicate with them may be by creating a slide deck with visuals highlighting um, each financial statement or information on each of the financials that you want to highlight for them. And then you could present as well how each metrics impacts overall financial health and what it means to those teams so that they really try to understand it. And when you're dealing with your team or um, you know, your employees, remember that everyone's motivations are different. So knowing how to tailor your communication with different groups within the company is essential for influencing others and achieving your goals. So active listening is very important. Effective leaders um, know when they need to talk, but more importantly, we need to know when we need to listen. So always ask for you know, employees, ideas, opinions, and feedback. And when they do share information, actively engage with them in conversation, pose questions, invite them to elaborate and take notes. Transparency is very important in communication. So whenever you're communicating financial trends and ratios uh, to non-finance professionals, it's important to provide context and try to be as transparent as possible. So for example, what does a decline in return or assets mean for their daily work? How do specific team goals impact the line items that you're presenting to them? When everyone understands the accounting information and its context and the meaning behind the numbers, then you will be communicating effectively to those you're speaking to. Also, as leaders, uh, when speaking openly about you know, your company goals, opportunities and challenges, that builds trust among your team and it helps foster an environment where employees feel empowered and they want to share ideas and collaborate. So it's important that each individual understands the role that they play in the company's success. And the more transparent we are as leaders, the easier it is for employees to make that connection. So clarity is important uh, when communicating, um, especially when you're communicating complex topics. So as accountants, you're likely to have a strong financial um, literacy and you'll have adopted finance terms into your vocabulary. So it's important that whenever you're communicating effectively, that you break down complex topics into easily understood language. And so you can relate to those with less experience in finance. So for instance, when communicating financial statements, uh, refrain from using acronyms and try and give brief definitions of technical terms when appropriate and explain um, each line um, and factor that into your calculations and be open to questions from people maybe who don't have a financial background. And whenever you're communicating with your employees, speak in specifics and define the desired result that you want from a project or an initiative and be clear about what you want to see achieved at each milestone. The clearer you are, the less confusion there will be around priorities and employees will know what they're working on and what they're working towards and they will feel more engaged in the process. Another top tip is the ability to ask open-ended questions. So if you want to understand an employee's or a stakeholder's motivations, thoughts or goals better, um, practice asking open-ended questions. By asking the right questions, you can elicit more thoughtful information, more thorough responses, and you will ensure that you have clarity around what you need to succeed. Empathy is listed as one of the top leadership skills required for success. So the better you get at acknowledging and understanding an employee's feelings and experiences, and the more heard and valued they will feel. And if you want to improve your communication and build a stronger, more productive culture, then practice responding with empathy. Open body language, we've already talked about the importance of this. 
So to ensure that you're conveying the right message, focus on your body language. Um, as we heard earlier, body language is really important to effectively communicate. So if you're trying to inspire someone, make eye contact and try and establish um, interest and a rapport and convey warmth and smile whenever you're speaking to them, because that will help to build trust. And then the final top tip is receiving and implementing feedback. So ask for feedback, um, and this will help you grow as a leader. And it will also help build trust among your colleagues and your stakeholders. It is critical, though, that whenever you ask for feedback, that you just don't listen to the feedback and don't do anything about it. If you continue to receive feedback um, and don't implement any changes, then people will lose faith in providing that feedback to you um, as a way no follow through. So it's likely that there will be uh, comments that you can't implement um, immediately or act upon, but there will be things that you can implement and act on. And just be transparent about that and feedback to your team what you can do and maybe what's not possible. And that will help them feel heard um, and that will help them uh, feel as though you've listened and you really value their perspective. So I want to show you a video now um, which really demonstrates the power of words and it's from a gentleman called Mohammed Kutani. And it's a very powerful video with some impactful messages. It is about seven minutes long, but um, hopefully you'll enjoy the video as it goes through. It tells, tells a story um, and the message behind it is, is very powerful. What? All you all think smoking kills? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Do you know that the amount of people dying from diabetes are three times as many people dying from smoking? Yet if I pulled a snicker bar, nobody would say anything. <laughs> Do you know that the leading cause of lung cancer is not actually a cigarette? It's your DNA. You could smoke for years and nothing will ever happen to you. This whole war against smoking is just to restrict the farming of tobacco. Mr. Kansas Chair, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I use these arguments, even though I just made them up, <laughs> with a group of my friends. And the results? Five of them believed what I said. Two of them started smoking. <laughs> Words, when said and articulated in the right way, can change someone's mind. They can alter someone's belief. You have the power to bring someone from the slums of life and make a successful person out of them. Or destroy someone's happiness using only your words. Does that seem a bit too good to be true? A simple choice of word can make a difference between someone accepting or denying your message. You can have a very beautiful thing to say, but say it in the wrong words and phew, it's gone. I have a son who's four, and he had this bad habit of writing on the walls with crayons. And one evening, I walked into his room, and he's going at it, just writing and drawing and so on. And I said, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Are you stupid? <laughs> Don't you ever do that again. And guess what happened? He did it again. <laughs> Nobody likes to be threatened. Nobody likes to be intimidated. His pride would not allow it. He did it again just to spite me. A week later, I walked into his room and again, he's going at it. And this time, he was even looking at me just... <laughs> I came down and said, sweetie, come here. Don't do that, you're a big boy now. And he never did it again, because his pride wants him to be the big boy. 
Have you ever wondered why nobody cares about global warming, even though it's a very serious issue? It could kill all of us. Because when you go home and you flip on the TV, and you see a scientist trying to talk about global warming, it goes something like this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as, I mean, as you can see from the graphs here, the statistics for, for 2014, it shows the water level is rising. <laughs> this, uh, this table shows that the monodioxic level in the third ozone layer is in a very alarming position. The message, never get across. <laughs> but most importantly, if you are a person who's a role model, if you are a person who's been admired, anything you say could be believed. Anything you utter could be taken as truth. My friend Nasser, he loved his father, idealized his father. He would do anything to make him happy. But his father was the kind of person who's not easy to impress. And year after year, Nasser tried, and his father was like, yeah. Fourth year in college, Nasser got straight A's. And he thought to himself, this is it. This is what will finally make my dad proud. He picked up the phone. He called his dad. Dad, I got straight A's. Are you proud? Please tell me you're proud, Father. Yeah, listen, son. I'll have to call you back. I'm busy. I'm busy was the single sentence that broke the camel's back. And he started drinking, doing drugs, hanging out with the wrong crowd. Now, so why? Why are you throwing your life away? If the one person in the world that I care about the most doesn't care, then, then why should I? And one evening I got the phone call. Nasser's in the emergency room, drug overdose. I rushed to that hospital. I saw him on that bed, and I saw that machine go beep, beep, beep. And I saw doctors try to bring him back to life. Clear! <laughs> Clear! <laughs> Clear! <laughs> it's clear that a single word could have saved this life. Words have power. Words are power. Words could be your power. You can change a life inspire a nation and make a, this world a beautiful place. Isn't that what we all wanted? Isn't that what we are all in this hall? Your mouth can spit venom or it can mend a broken soul. Ladies and gentlemen, let that be our goal. Come to share. Okay, so that's a very powerful video and it's quite an emotive video as well. And really words are powerful and your words are powerful and words articulated in the right way can change lives. So it's important that we think about how we communicate because communication is very powerful. Mohammed's son had a similar habit to my daughter Zara. And when my daughter was little, she would write on the walls. And instead of me saying to Zara, Zara, please don't do that, uh, you know better. Um, maybe if I had said, sorry, you're a big girl now and big girls don't write on walls, uh, then maybe she would have stopped sooner. So think about how you use your conversations whenever you're talking to your team about something that they may need to change. So think about words that will emotionally connect with them or have meaning to them. So an example may be that, you know, if you say, you know, you know better, uh, please don't do that if somebody is late. So if you have somebody that's coming in late, 
Um, it may be good to have a conversation about uh, how they see themselves and how they want others to see them. So do they want to be seen as someone who is reliable, fully committed, always shows up and gives their best? Do they want to progress into further positions within the business or the company? Do they want to be respected and be respectful of their team and their company? Um, and then they may see it in a different way and they may see how important it is to be in on time. Um, so that will hopefully help you think about how you could have a very different conversation around a specific topic if there is things that you need to discuss with people. So communication is really the, at the core of effective communication um, or effect, communication is really at the core of effective leadership and in accountancy. And if you want to influence and inspire your team and the companies you work with, um, think about how you communicate. And hopefully these tips will help you think about how you communicate with your audiences. And I'm going to leave you with five C's of communication. So hopefully you'll be able to remember these. So the five C's of communication are clear, cohesive, complete, concise, and concrete. So be clear about the message that you want to communicate. Be cohesive by staying on topic. Complete your idea with supporting content and evidence and data and financial figures. Be concise by eliminating unnecessary words or maybe unnecessary figures that people maybe don't need within the communication and be concrete by using precise words. So hopefully this content today will help you put into practice um, and improve your communication techniques. So I'm gonna leave you with a task to do this week, a challenge, something that you, um, you know, could, could take up. So I challenge you to use your words uh, to tell somebody that they are doing a great job and that you appreciate them. So why not select one person maybe in your personal life and someone in your professional life? So in your personal life, it could be your partner, your kids, your friends, or even your parents. Um, and in your professional life, it could be your colleague, a supplier, maybe a stakeholder, someone you work with, or even somebody in a different department and tell them they're doing a great job. So use your words to positively impact someone. And I guarantee that this will make their day and it will make you feel good as well. So that really brings us to the end of this session today. Uh, we have covered a lot. We covered um, how we communicate. Uh, we discovered that we communicate on three different levels. We also um, covered left brain, right brain, and we learned that there is 89% uh, of you that are left, more left brained within this group, and uh, you know, nine or 11% who are more uh, right brained. Um, and we also then covered a variety of tips to help you communicate effectively. Effectively, so communication is really at the core of the accounting profession. And I hope this content you have enjoyed today um, and you find it really useful. So I want to thank you so much for all your participation. You've been wonderful. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. So Annette, I'll hand back over to you. Well, thanks, Myra. I was going to say you've done a great job and we appre really appreciate your time today. So thank you so much for, for all your time and effort. Uh, and I know the preparation that's gone into this. So it is much appreciated. Um, if anyone does have any questions, you know, you can leave it in the, the Q&A and we could pick it up. Um, but we've covered an awful lot. So I would just like to say at this stage, thank you so much. Um, just to advise as well that we will send out a feedback survey and we'd ask you to complete that because it really does help us shape future events. So that will issue um, very shortly. Uh, I said as well, you know, the session has been recorded, so we will issue um, the session and the slides as well. And just on behalf of the Chartered Accountants Ulster Society, I'd like to highlight that there is the AGM next Thursday, the 6th of June at 4.30. That's in the Merchant, and it will be followed by summer drinks from 5 p.m. Um, everyone is welcome to attend that event. It's a free event, but you do need to register. So Karen has just put the details there into the chat box of um, the link on how you, you register for that. So um, I'll just do a little pause and use power in my pause and say thanks again to Myra and, and to the team um, for putting this together. It's been really, really useful. Thank you so much.